Hi, Stephanie Abrams here, dashing through the airport. I'm going on an adventure. I've got my backpack, I've got my laptop, I've got my traveling shoes on. Come along with me. I am so happy to be in a glorious suite at Clontarf Castle Hotel in County Dublin. And I am with the general manager of this glorious hotel in Ireland, Jason Ormston. Thank you so much for making time. I know you're so busy today. You are fairly new as the GM here, aren't you? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And Cade, Neela Fawlty, 100,000 welcomes to Clontarf Castle. And maybe you can um, just give us a minute on why people should choose Clontarf Castle Hotel over so many other options in the region. Well, I, I think I, I can say with confidence that Clontarf Castle is is truly uh, a unique, uh, unique experience. And and I suppose I say the word experience because that's what we offer here. It's, it's not a stay, it's, it's not a hotel, it's an experience that we're offering. Uh, and only, only an establishment that has just celebrated its 845th New Year uh, can truly offer an experience. And, the, and part of our experience is it's the, the depth of the generations of stories that have taken place within these walls that have added all the nuances over the years to build uh, something very special here. Um, that mix of, of heritage and tradition uh, combined with style and elegance is, is something that's truly unique, not just here in Dublin, but in Ireland. And, and we also feel confident to say even further afield. Well, it's interesting because the word castle is sometimes used by brand new hotels that were just built last week. They're, especially in Ireland, castles are often, um, that's the name given to what is truly a manor house or a kind of um, a Georgian or Victorian home, and someone's decided to call it a castle. But Clontarf Castle's roots truly go back to historic castle days in, what, the 1200s? Yes, yeah, we're a, we're a 12th century castle. Uh, we were completed uh, as a building in 1172, and that's why it was, it's, it's 845 years of heritage here with us. Here we now, of course, have our bedrooms as well, which is a wonderful addition. We're almost about to celebrate our 20th anniversary of adding on the old bedroom, uh, the bedroom suites uh, and that wing of the castle, uh, which happened 20 years ago in 1998. And the best part is, with all the sense of history and tradition and fairy tales, storybook wonderfulness, you can plug in your laptop and get the highest speed I have ever seen anywhere in the world in a hotel, somewhere between 350 and 450 megabytes. It's just the speed of sound for sending anything you need to upload and move on as we do. We're going to now sit down and have a lengthy chat that we will broadcast on radio. You'll find it at travelers411.com in podcast for a year and at sabrams.com and elsewhere cross-reference throughout our websites, sabrams.com and travelers411.com forever and ever with links to clontarfcastlehotel.ie. I'm with Sarah Slazinger in one of the offices uh, where the heartbeat of Powers Court House and Garden decisions are made. And um, she's the managing director and a descendant of the family that was clever enough to purchase this property. I, you know, it's it's beyond imagination to think that it can be privately owned. Really, when you think about it, it's just an amazing and magnificent place to visit. But why should people make a point of coming here to visit? I think, Stephanie, the best way I can put it is that Powers Court is probably the most beautiful and most intriguing estate that you'll find anywhere in Ireland. What makes it that? 
I think the setting is absolutely stunning. Now, Ireland, as you know, is famous for its scenery, but what makes Powers Court different is that it takes that natural landscape and it has created something really breathtaking within that setting between the fantastic specimen trees that we have um, within the garden, the terraces that have been created to create this amazing backdrop for the house itself. And it has a very special atmosphere. From the moment you come in through the main gate and up the beach avenue, which is over 250 years old, you have these majestic trees as you wind your way up through, through the avenue before you come to the main house. We're blessed because the seventh Viscount who created the gardens and collected all of these wonderful specimen trees from, from all over the world, he, he never got to see this wonderful creation. Yes, he started it. He planted the trees. But well, we're, well, we're the ones that are benefiting from that because these trees are now 150 years old and they're really reaching their true majestic uh, brilliance in terms of their prime. And I think that's the, the thing that captures people's imagination when they come to Powers Court. Not only did Lord Powers Court collect these wonderful specimen trees, but he did exactly as you describe. He went all around Europe gathering inspiration from the grand uh, European gardens. And he, if, he, if he couldn't purchase an original fountain or an original urn to decorate his garden, he commissioned new ones, um, it, the replicas wow. of ones that, 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 are, the that are in, 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 the, <laughs> in the, the gardens in Europe. So we have urns from Versailles. We have... Um, uh, we have lions from uh, from Rome. We have fountains from Rome, and we have ironwork from Germany and Italy. So, you know, he really took the best of the best in Europe and brought it back here to County Wicklow in Ireland. And that's what really surprises and amazes people when they come to Paris Court. They just never expect to find such a gem hidden away in the Wicklow Mountains here. You know, in the, in the days of the Normans, when there was a castle here, and that's where, in fact, the name Paris Court comes from, because it was a, a, a Norman conqueror who came, Eustace de la Poor, and de Poor became power, became Paris Court. So that's where the name derives. And actually, the castle is incorporated in the present house. So you have a medieval castle surrounded by an, uh, an 18th century Palladian style castle and house. And the castle, the, the house itself, um, was uh, utilized uh, as the setting for a film I saw decades ago, a film I'm not particularly crazy about. And I, I frankly would have gotten up and left the theater because it was, I didn't find the film particularly interesting. The reason I didn't was I loved the background scenery of where it was shot and the costumes, and that's what kept me sitting in my seat. And those of you who are film buffs may know the film Barry Lyndon. I don't know if you'll agree with my critical review. I found it quite boring, except for, well, they cut the audio and just let me look <laughs> at the setting and the scenery in the background. And parts of that were filmed here, no? Yeah, and that's what's so wonderful. And at that point, my grandparents had done a lot of restoration work in the house. Mm. So it was really at its absolute peak. And at least we have somewhat of a record of what the house looked like. I'm so lucky to have you join me in the parlor of my favorite suite at Fitzpatrick Castle in Kalini, County Dublin, Ireland, an area that likes to call itself the Beverly Hills of Dublin. And truly it is. It's just this gorgeous area. And Fitzpatrick Castle is perched upon a hillside where on a clear day you can see all the way to the Mountains of Mourne in the north. It's just an incredible place to be with wonderful pampering style from the family owned and operated Fitzpatrick Castle. And I have with me Ethna Fitzpatrick, who is the chief cook, bottle washer and caretaker of all things important. Thank you so much for making time to join us today. Well, thank you, Stephanie. It's always a pleasure and always a pleasure to have you both here. 
How long ago was it that your dad bought Fitzpatrick Castle? My late dad bought Kalini in the latter part of 1970 and then opened it in 71 as a hotel. But when he bought it, it was a ver- veritable wreck, very derelict, very run down and in bad need of a lot of tender, loving care. Well, clearly the family has given that tender, loving care over the years. How many accommodations are there here? We have 113 rooms and that includes uh, 11 suites. And then we're on six acres of parkland. Yeah, it's gorgeous here. And then you have lots of banquet and meeting room space and other public areas that are of value to the traveler. Yeah, well, it's a big, diverse hotel. Um, Obviously, it's been expanded over the years. So you have the original Old Castle House, which you're sitting in, is really quite small. There are only 11 rooms in total there. But then we've expanded out with a new and a complete new extension with larger executive rooms, family rooms, sea view rooms that overlook the bay, a big swimming pool and fitness center with gym, jacuzzi, saunas, all the, you know, all the good stuff. And then banqueting and conferencing, we can cater up to 600 people. So yeah, we've a load of variety in terms of meeting and conference space. And we can host very large banquets, which is really in a really different kind of venue outside of Dublin. Just about every time I have been here, there has been some major event going on. Um, I have been here when there were fashion shows and fundraisers and weddings. And and clearly, this is a place that people like to choose for weddings for so many reasons. Maybe you can just give us a couple. Okay, well, I think maybe the age of the family business. I mean, we're now into our third generation. Um, I think there's a loyalty and a love of the brand Fitzpatrick. So therefore, people that would have come as our first customers are now kind of choosing us to come with their grandchildren or their grandchildren may well be saying, I always wanted to get married in a castle and that was the first castle I saw. So there are varying reasons, but a lot of it is definitely loyalty and friendship from the local area and beyond. I'll tell you something else I see all the time. I am, um, I'm the person that slides into breakfast at the very last moment because I'm really not a morning person. And when I am leaving breakfast in the dining room and coming across your lobby lounge, it is filled with people who are everything from friends getting together for morning coffee or tea, people who are being interviewed by other companies in the lobby of your hotel, people having business meetings, because your lobby lounge area is set up in a way that creates, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 small, congenial conversation areas. And later in the day, you'll see people coming in, having lunch there, coming in for tea time in the afternoon, I mean, it's, and then for drinks in the evening. That coupled with your bar, that you walk through those amazing antique gates that make you feel like you have entered some very auspicious place. I mean, it's just quite remarkable. Yeah, I think we are the gathering. We are the gathering center for Kalini, and there is no doubt you can walk through our lobby at any time of the day or night and be quite surprised at who you might meet. Um, It seems to be the local area to go it's conducive to having a quiet conversation it's also conducive to having a good old get together with pals and family members and so we're kind of we meet everybody's needs um, and yet we try to be discreet well discreet or not given the roster of famous celebrities who live in the neighborhood that wraps around Fitzpatrick Castle in Kalini. I'd like to walk through and see Bono or or Liam Neeson or Pierce Brosnan or Enya or, you know, just pop into the chair next to them and cozy up. <laughs> I hope that happens for me sometime soon. Uh, for more of our conversation with Ethna Fitzpatrick about Fitzpatrick Castle and the area in County Dublin that surrounds Fitzpatrick Castle, Check in at our podcasts at travelers411.com and sabrams.com, sabrams.com for the archived audio of the radio broadcast of the continuation of this interview. This is Stephanie Abrams live from Fitzpatrick Castle in Kalini, County Dublin. We've got a lot to talk about. Stay tuned for more.
on the line with me is Lisa Collins. Lisa, her title is Quiet Man Tour Guide. But I seem to remember, Lisa, well, the first time I talked with your dad, Jerry, he told me that you were the underlying guiding spirit and creator of the whole Quiet Man Museum experience, but you were busy off chasing another career, at least for the last more than a dozen years. So um, do I have that straight? Yes, that's right, Stephanie. Um, I worked with my dad and we, we set up the Quiet Man Tours together uh, back in 1990. So um, I brought tourists around the village of Kong on a walking tour um, through the grounds of Ashford Castle and brought them to see all of the locations in the movie such as Inishfree, Castle Town, the Pat Cohan's Bar, the fishing scenes, the courting scenes, the Squire down at her house. So people really, really enjoyed that. And um, the one big question they all had was, where is the original cottage where Sean and Mary Kate lived after they got married? And Sean and, Sean and Mary is, Kate were played by whom? Sean was played by John Wayne, the Duke. And Mary Kate was played by Maureen O'Hara, the beautiful, red-headed, um, fantastic actress from Dublin. And... Um, the, the the original cottage where they lived after they got married in the movie, unfortunately, it had fallen into disrepair and ruin. It's about 14 miles away from our little village of Kong. It's in Connemara. So we decided that um, because all of the inside scenes in the movie were shot in Hollywood, that we would try to recreate the inside and the outside of the cottage in Kong, which is the real home of the quiet man. 90% of the locations are in Kong. So we built a little cottage in the heart of the village and we opened it up as a visitor experience for people to come and see um, what was um, basically the Hollywood set done up as it was in the movie at the cottage where Mary Kate had her china and her pewter and all her things shining about her. Um, we have costumes created by the same people uh, who made them for the director John Ford in 1951. They're on display there um, and people really get excited to come in, to try on the costumes, to dress up for photos, to do reenactments. So we still do all of the walking tours and we bring people to all of the locations and we finish up in the museum. You mentioned, Lisa, uh, that the costumes um, that are in the museum, that some of which you dress people up in, because I remember visiting years ago and being dressed up with a shawl and my husband put into a kind of suede vest with a little cap. Uh, very Irish style, like, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, who made the cap in your place, but the ones we have are from Hannah Hats and Donny <laughs> mm-hmm. So it so was John Ford. Is John Ford mm-hmm. Irish also? Yes, he, his ancestors, um, I think, I believe it was his great grandfather, um, was from, sorry, his grandfather was from Spittle in County Galway. Ah, um, he, Spittle. He said he learned Irish at his mother's knee, and when he was in Ireland, he spoke Irish to all of the local people here. Really? He was very proud of his ancestry, and it was his dream to make The Quiet Man. He It was originally a short story written by the County Kerry author Morris Walsh, and it was published in the Saturday Evening Post in America in the 30s. And Ford fell in love with it because it resonated with him telling the story of an Irish-American um, returning home to Ireland after living in America for a number of years. And he wanted to honour his ancestors and make the movie, but none of Hollywood studios thought it was going to be a success. They thought it was a Irish tale that would make no money, that would be a major flop. The only condition on which they eventually agreed to give Ford money to make The Quiet Man was if he made two westerns to cover the losses that they thought The Quiet Man was to incur. Oh my gosh. So, yeah, they didn't realize at the time that they were making an all-time classic with a, a, a film that has a cult following today with people coming from all over the world to see where John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara made this most fantastic movie and a film that won two Oscars, would you believe? So they really underestimated The Quiet Man. 
and the management of Micheline's Manor B&B, a B&B that is themed with memorabilia throughout uh, related to the Quiet Man film, a classic film. Um, and I'm glad now that I know it was John Ford who was the director uh, starring John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. And I think I'm going to have to, after this conversation, watch it again. So are there other family members involved in the business, Lisa? Well, my mum, she looks after Micheline's Manor. So she was a chef in Ashford Castle, which is a famous um, castle. It's voted one of the most luxurious hotels in the world um, a couple of years ago. So she was a chef there in the 80s uh, during President Ronald Reagan's visit. And she always dreamed of having her own um, bed and breakfast. So um, as the Quiet Man business developed, um, we decided we would build a bed and breakfast, and she runs that. So my no, wait, and my dad there. run stop, the tours. Stop there. Stop there. You say you built a bed and breakfast. Do you mean you built the business, or you actually built that building? Oh, no, they built the building. Wow. It doesn't look like a new build. It has a very old, uh, it is gorgeous. People, you have to see it. It is this beautiful stone, very Georgian classic looking building. And, um, it looks like a Georgian manor house actually built of gray stone. And, but it looks like, I mean, like one of the period houses you would find just about anywhere in Ireland. I had no idea that was a new build. All of the interior scenes were shot in Hollywood after the exterior scenes were shot in Ireland. So they took all of the costumes back to America with them. And so, uh, as I also said, they underestimated The Quiet Man. Nobody thought it would be such a success. Apart from, I presume, all the cast and crew and John Ford, they knew the magic that they were creating. But they... um, Unfortunately, the costumes and a lot of the set was not preserved. Um, and so what we have done here in Kong is try to recreate that Hollywood set um, as best we can. People, when you go to Kong, um, there are a number of things that you really need to do. One of them is um, if you need an, a light snack, a little munchable, a, a lunch that... It's not going to take a lot of time, but um, it will, you know, make your tummy happy. Just up the street from the Quiet Man Museum is a cute place called, um, I think it's called the Hungry Monk. Have I got it right? That's it, exactly. Oh, it cute. is homemade Irish food, beautiful uh, scones, cakes, salads, real top-notch food. Yeah, well, I can remember having wonderful soups and sandwiches there. And the thing yes. that's nice is it's very affordable, and it doesn't take you all day to have lunch. If you want to do something fancy like a high tea or stop for cocktails or, you know, some a fancy lunch or dinner, um, dress appropriately and uh, make a reservation in Ashford Castle. And um, a lot of the scenery that you will see in... The film, The Quiet Man, was actually shot on the grounds of Ashford Castle, but the castle itself is not in the film. And when you enter the road that kind of winds its way toward the castle, you'll recognize the trees in the film. But when you walk into The Quiet Man a museum, what do you see? Explain the experience of the visitor. What are you seeing and what are you experiencing? Well, it's a replica of the cottage where Sean, that was played by John Wayne, and Mary Kate, played by Marna Hara, where they lived after they got married. It's a typical Irish cottage, thatched roof, emerald green half door, whitewashed front. And then inside, you see all of their furniture, their costumes, uh, promotional posters from the movie that that were promoting the film before it was released. We have um, newspaper cuttings from all of the local newspapers telling the story of what happened as the film was being made here and as Hollywood invaded our sleepy little village. Um, We have a tandem bicycle, the famous um, replica of the bike that John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara took off on when they wanted to get away from their chaperone during the courting scenes. Um, And we have the original harness from uh, Micheline Oak's horse, Napoleon. 
it's a self-guided visit, so you can take as uh, long or as uh, short as you like. What we do on our walking tours is that we start at the cottage and we walk around the village to all of the locations that I mentioned earlier, like the Dying Man's House, the Pakoham Bar, Inishfree, the Reverend Clayfair's House, the fight scenes, and... Um, throughout that tour, we also stop at the John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara commemorative statue. Um, throughout that tour, people um, can interact and can do reenactments at the various locations, can take photos for their memories. And then we finish up at the museum and we do a big reenactment scene there, which is great fun. People have really good crack, Irish crack, or a crack in Ireland is a word for fun. So they have really good crack dressing up and reenacting the scenes. But give us uh, a sense of where uh, the walking and or driving parts of the tour go to. Yes. Well, the walking tour is just around our village, so it's a very short walk. Um, we have 80, 90-year-olds doing it during the summer. Um, the whole thing around the village and into the museum lasts about 45 minutes to an hour. But for those who would prefer not to walk, we also, I started last year, chauffeur tours, which include all of those locations, also the locations in the Ashford Castle Estate, which are, um, are the um, Squire Danaher House, where the fight scene started in the hayfield, where Sean, John Wayne, sees Mary Kate for the first time when she's herding sheep. Um, some, um, some of the fishing scenes, the church scenes where they played patty fingers in the holy water. So we, we drive to all of those lo- locations and people can get out and take photos and touch all the places that were in the movie. Um, so all of those are, are in the village of Kong. They're very um, in short proximity to each other, but oh. we do show for tours to those. And okay. then we also can bring people to the locations that are a bit more far flung. Well, I'll tell you something cute. You know when you cross that bridge, on the, mm-hmm. when, you, when you come off the main road, you cross the bridge, on the right side, right there beside the bridge, there's a house? Yes. There's a big sign right there that says, do not park your car here. <laughs> so a lot of people must cross that bridge, park the car to take photos at the bridge, and the the folks that live there aren't pleased. <laughs> no. They meet a lot of tourists, I think, every year. <laughs> well, they Locking ought, up their driveway. <laughs> yeah, well, they ought to put up a stand and sell something, you know. It would pay their mortgage <laughs> off. I want to thank you so much for joining us this hour. Lisa Collins, Quiet Man Museum. We've got a lot to talk about. Stay tuned for more. And gentlemen, this is Patrick, your captain speaking, so I'd like to welcome you all on board. time here and an awful lot of money here as well. Uh, between 1868 and 1880 Lord Ardalon spent one million pounds of 19th century money and that was just on a country home. That'll show you how wealthy the Guinness family were. 
Lord Ardemont died in 1915, and his brother then, Edward Cecil Guinness, inherited the castle for a while. And Edward Cecil Guinness was actually running the brewery in Dublin. So all the Guinnesses that went before him, all the Guinnesses that went before him came down from Galway on their private steamer yacht, the Lady Eglinton, having arrived from Dublin in Galway by train. They took their steamer yacht down the lake to their summer home. Unlike those, Ernest Guinness had his own private seaplane, and that seaplane would be moored in uh, Dunleary Harbour in Dublin. And he'd get into that plane and fly down across the country and land that plane right here on the lake behind us. What a way to live that was. But he eventually more or less donated the entire estate to the Irish government in 1938. £20,000 is all that changed hands, a mere fraction of its true value. The government in turn then broke up the estate. All of the woodland behind us along the lake shore was given over to the forestry department. They own that today. All the farmland was divided among the tenant farmers by the Land Commission and the castle with its remaining 350 acres was leased out to Noel Huggard from Waterville and Kerry. I'm with Michelle Coughlin, the general manager, here at Kilronan Castle in County Roscommon. You know, Roscommon, uh, there's a town, a city called Roscommon, and it's in Roscommon. And like there's Dublin in County Dublin, and there's Galway in County Galway. But Kilronan Castle is not in any big town or village or city. It sits by itself on this majestic estate, and it truly is a fairy tale experience to arrive and to stay here. I'm hoping you're going to make some plans to stay a night or two or three or seven. But if all you can fit in is come for high tea or lunch or dinner, you need to at least do that so that you can put Kilronan Castle on your next trip to Ireland if you can't make it on the one that's hopefully coming up soon. How have you been, darling? I've been great, Stephanie. Thank you very much and great to have you here. Really wonderful to have you back with us again. We're thrilled. Well, you know, just arriving up the drive is an experience in what relaxation and fairy tales are all about, isn't it? It really is. When were you here the first time? The very first time you can remember coming onto the grounds of Kilronan Castle. Well, would you believe I'm 10 years here now, since last November, 10 years. Wow, and you know, I think I found Kilronan probably two or three months after you had just arrived. That's right. So That's we right. know each other so a long time We now. do. We know each other BC, <laughs> before children. Yes, we do, we do. <laughs> when you see a woman who is the general manager of a hotel or a resort, that is one spectacular, competent, fabulous person because the sector of travel and tourism that is hotel general manager position is remarkably, overwhelmingly dominated by men. It, it really is. It really is. But there's a few of us out there. There's a few of us well, out there. Well, there are. And, they, you know, and every time I meet a woman that is a general manager, I know before I sit down to talk with her that she's fantastic. Because well, the competition you. is huge. Massive. I mean, we probably all could learn so much from you because it's not as if you're a single woman. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. <laughs> and it's all about you and your career. No, no. You've got not. a growing family out there. I do. I yes, do indeed. Yes, they're marvelous. <laughs> And I, you know, so I think one day you really need to sit down and write Michelle Coughlin's tips on yes. how to keep it all together. <laughs> <laughs> Someday when I have time to think about that, it could be a good book. It could be a good book. For the, for the moment, it's going to be tough to just find it's the time. It's spinning for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the personality that <clears throat> just naturally seeps from your pores, uh, I've never seen you, no matter what three ring circus is going on here <laughs> and you know this has become such a popular place with such good reason to be because yes. of its location because of its beautiful grounds because of the wonderful food and the beautiful accommodations mm -hmm. and uh, a staff that pays attention to everything yes you know it's 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 mind-boggling to think that with all that going on in times when you've got, you know, check, guests checking in and checking out and a wedding about to happen and, and doing it all is just 
you're a remarkable. But I have a great team, and I suppose that's that's the biggest tip, and that's the biggest secret of all. Um, we have a wonderful management team, and I suppose over the years I've I've learned to be quite a good delegator. Um, you know, it, it's a big property; you can't do it all yourself. You have to rely on others, and uh, I've been here long enough. I can give them the guidance they need, but um, I really do have a remarkable management team. How big is the property? So the property we're set on fifty acres. We have eighty-five bedrooms. Um, there is a beautiful spa, which we have 10 treatment rooms, including couples treatment rooms, gorgeous swimming pool and gym facilities as well, um, just for... Tell us case. about the swimming pool. The swimming pool, well, that's set right down in the basement, but there's beautiful lights and lovely ambience all around about it. And there's also a steam room, a sauna and a jacuzzi set down there you also. Know, I, I have never been in that pool. I, I can't, you, you tell me that and I can't believe it. I hope you brought your bathing suit this time. Well, well I have and I'm hoping I actually get into okay, it. Okay, okay. And what it reminds me of is Roman baths gone 21st century modern. I'm expecting people in togas yes. to come prancing out at any moment. They wouldn't be out of place, right? No, they wouldn't <laughs> because there's this, this wonderful elegance. Yes. But it's quite serene. It's very serene. And yes. it reminds me a bit. Have you been to Bath, England? Yes. And you see the old mm -hmm. from antiquity Absolutely. Roman baths. Yes. It's that gone modern. Yeah. It Amazing. Is. It is. It's very. We're nice. going to take a quick commercial break. Pay attention, people. Take notes. This must be the version for a giant of my book, Rumors. Rumors by Stephanie Abrams, filled with love and lust and lies, intrigue, secrets, and a whodunit. Check out your favorite online bookseller, Rumors by Stephanie Abrams. We have so much more to visit and talk about. Don't leave me, Stephanie Abrams here. You know, I'm so tired of hearing about the rain in Ireland. Everywhere I go, people talk about the rain in Ireland. Have you noticed how sunny the pictures are? I can't open my eyes, people. <laughs> I am squinting behind my glasses that are busy turning dark in the sunshine. But we're here in front of Dirty Nellies. There's actually a Dirty Nellies in Boston, but they spell it differently, and it doesn't look anything like this Dirty Nellies. But that's that section in Boston that makes you feel like you are in Ireland. So on your way to Ireland, you might want to stop in Boston and snoop around, especially in the most historic sections. And Dirty Nellies has been here for about forever and ever. I'm going to say about 400 years. When you go inside, you'll see there's first a little pub area and then with a fireplace and whatever, and it's quite small and cozy. But you go into the back and the restaurant opens up and it's still small and cozy and lots and lots of uh, badges and um, banners that were gifts from fire departments and police departments in the U.S. where uh, members of our finest and bravest have come to visit, have a pint. <laughs> <laughs> and leave behind a memento so you'll see it here and you're looking up at Bunratty Castle a um, wonderful historic place you can visit they do run uh, groaning board dinners kind of renaissance dinners medieval dinners at night uh, that you can buy into with music and food and an experience you will long remember and there is the Bunratty Folk Village and you walk about the village and you'll find like in Starbridge, Massachusetts or in uh, Old Bethpage Restoration on Long Island there are buildings of a variety of kinds from the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the milliner and there's a little tavern in there as well and um, you can go and have a bite in there and you can actually eat in what used to be the kitchen I like to eat there, it's a cozy fun part and this is in County Clare in Bunratty in Ireland.
Pro Deo, the family motto is Pro Deo et Regi, for God and our King. Gotcha. But you will notice the difference between this motto and that motto when we go to the Seventh Center, which is Pro Deo et Patria ad Astra. Which is on your gates. Yes. Which is on the Seventh Center gates. What is yes. that? Stars. Yeah, you see that was that. right. Yeah. So there's a double entendre for God and our country to the stars. Right, yes. Can mean literally astronomy yes. or can mean ultimate Absolute ambition. Right, yeah. back next week, same time, same station. So good to travel with you. This is Stephanie Abrams, Travel TV. <laughs>